Ah, Rumeria. Silly, silly Rumeria. You know, it's funny. I'd always assumed Remus was just nuts, but everything we got this patch truly paints him in a much better light. I mean, he's still nuts, you know, don't, don't get me wrong, but a, a sweet kind of nuts. He cares for his little empire and the people in it. I mean, he's got to have one of the most tragic tales amongst the gods yet so far, right? I mean, it's just failure after failure until his death, trying to save the empire. But at the end of the day, humanity's arrogance and vanity proved far too much for even a god king to handle. And I mean, his plans, you know, while you know, uh, extremely, uh, 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 what's a nice way to put this? Uh, fucking horrendous. <laughs> They all have good intentions behind them. I really do feel for my brother Remus, but run from it, dread it, our beloved sustainer of heavenly principles was right. The irrigation of mankind ends now. I will say, however, it was hilarious to learn that <laughs> Romero was just chilling beneath the waves for a couple thousand years with a bunch of people in rock form, and I thought that I thought that thing got sent to the Shadow Realm, dog. No survivor. So, I mean, Remus isn't, you know, he's not a complete failure. His people are, it's, you know, in a, in a sense, immortal. With regards to the world's quest, one important question was answered, and it's how did God King Remus meet his end? Just because, think about it. Rumeria just sank beneath the waves. That cannot have been enough to kill a god. So, how exactly did Remus die. Between the main world quest and the new artifact set, we got a hefty amount of lore concerning not just the fall of Rumeria, but also God King Remus himself, with the most interesting being, we now know who gave Remus that special goblet when he went into the Primordial Sea. Before 4.7, the text simply referred to this other party as the First Sovereign. However, now we know that person was Egeria, whom Remus visited whilst she was imprisoned to find a way to avert the prophecy. We also <laughs> hilariously found out Remus originally came from Sumeru, but left after God King Deshret conquered his homeland, which... I mean, clearly there's there's levels to this shit amongst the God Kings. Hey, they didn't, they didn't call my nigga Deshret the son of the sky for nothing, dog. After leaving Sumeru, Remus became a wanderer, and somehow <laughs> his bitch ass wound up under Ermitsoles. <laughs> <laughs> so fucking somehow, where he encountered a prophet named, okay, uh, Sibylia, who told him he will rule a mighty nation once more, but it will end terribly. Worth pointing out, Sibylia said she was an envoy who lost her form in mind, which makes it likely she was once a Sealy. What's odd, however, is the form she took in front of Remus was that of small golden bees, as opposed to, you know, whatever these whiskey little phantom shits are. Anyway, as per usual, to ensure we're all on the same page moving forward, we should go over the main world quest this patch, Canticles of Harmony. It wasn't even voiced, so I know you guys are... <laughs> I, know, I know, you niggas are. Uh, so without further ado, my guppy friends, let's recap the lovely story that is Rumeria in the modern era. The quest starts out with us arriving on the small island of Petrichor for no particular reason. I mean, we are travelers at the end of the day. We overhear two individuals speak in an odd manner whilst discussing moving some boxes onto their boats. They mention wanting to be quick before the Dark Lord's lackeys catch up with them. When we approach them, they express relief we aren't minions of this Dark Lord Remus, but rather some foreigners. When we relay, we have no idea who the fuck the Dark Lord Sauron, or I mean Remus is, they break out into to a song and dance stating long ago Fontanians used to live peacefully on this island before the Dark Lord and an army of his golems came and took it over. The weak Fontanians switched sides after being tempted by the Dark Lord's music, but the strong ones never stopped fighting. Upon seeing us enamored at their little performance, they call us minions for liking performances and decide to fight us because they were not putting on a performance, they were deadly serious. They unfortunately, you know, for them, lose the fight and flee in shame, leaving us to inspect their boxes. We find nothing odd, but when we approach a statue, our minds are seemingly swapped to an Imperator's. The Imperator Traitor is obviously God King Remus in some distant past, and we witness one of his courtiers inform him, today is the day the musical symphony will be sound. Remus informs the fellow he had a dream of the sea swallowing the earth. The man tells Remus he need not worry about the prophecy, for all they do is done to fight against fates. The man tells us to follow him, and so we do. He comments that despite the fact that Remus gave everyone immortal bodies, they are all still bound by fate, so let me just give some context. Part of Remus's plan to avert the prophecy was to give people new bodies that wouldn't die. He used the aforementioned cup of the primordial sea he got from Egeria to create a golden icor that would capture people's wisdom and memories, whilst discarding them of their physical bodies. Then he placed that shit, you know, their souls in a golems or whatever the fuck, and set them free so they'd have these 
these stone bodies. Quote, the arrogance usurper once attempted to mix insoluble ichor with pure water to contain wisdom and memories, allowing his subjects and servants to discard their physical bodies and obtain independent eternal lives. But the pain of severing soul and body cannot be endured by an ordinary life, and the usurper's order tore apart and shattered souls. The Archor was dyed black by the crying and howling of so many souls, and it lost its harmony and wisdom, leaving only chaos and madness. I can just imagine Egeria handing him the cup of the water, and he's like, hey, hey, be smart with this cup of primordial water. It's the good shit right here. And he, you know, he just looks at it and goes, I got the perfect plans. <laughs> <laughs> uh, back to the quest. Despite now having bodies that won't deteriorate, uh, they are still bound by fates, and thus the NPC says something called Phobos or the Symphony will weave their fates anew. He says the melody of this symphony will free humanity from fates, and he says this all while we are walking into the greatest set piece of the entire game. I mean, God, God damn, man, look how bougie this shit looks. See, this is this is what you'd expect of a god. King. As we stare out, however, the screen goes dark, and when the picture comes back, the stage loses all its luster and magic, and we hear another voice call to us. The voice says, despite Remus claiming he would break free from the shackles of fate, his kingdom is currently being torn apart, and this new immortal race of people he created are killing everything in a senseless war. Remus asks the voice, if he remembers the promise they made to which the voice replies, yes. Uh, we're then sucked back into reality, and as we venture further into the island, we come across another person we believe is putting on a performance, who provides an alternative name for God King Remus. Se Se Sebastos, which, I mean, the word just looks a fucking lot like asbestos. Attention. If you or a loved one was diagnosed with mesothelioma, you may be entitled to financial compensation. Mesothelioma is a rare cancer linked to asbestos exposure. <laughs> but whatever. <laughs> Dark Lord Remus is apparently what the barbarians called Remus. Uh, I mean, this guy then just like fucking collapses because, you know, that's always fun. We are then approached by another NPC who is the only normal person on the island and introduces himself as Este. Este speaks of a fading castle adventurers would often come and look for, but notes that, you know, given the time it's saying, there's probably nothing of value there anymore. We head on over to the direction of the castle, where by purpose we run into a heterochromatic cat. The cat says, We are the chosen ones who must enter the ancient kingdom, still the chaotic symphony, and save the lost souls. That's cat's we are now calling Aussie, says it's the spirit keeper of the ancient realm. It's recently awoken because the symphony has begun acting up and has stolen their souls. In turn, the people of the island of Petricor have been giving ancient identities of that of Rumerians. The cat says this will not stop, and eventually this will happen to all of Fontaine. So, we need to be the ones to stop it now. When we reach the castle, Aussie tells us the symphony was once mighty and beautiful, and the fact that it's gone haywire right now is no doubt due to a bad actor. As we venture further into the castle, we do some music shit, and before we know it, a man walks through a portal. He instantly recognizes who the cat is, despite thousands of years having gone by. The man laughs at his current form, and he introduces himself as Boethus, a Hormost of Phobos. A really quick, a Hormost, or I guess it's Harmos, but just Hormost sounds more natural to me. <laughs> <laughs> is simply a person with whom Remus shared power and authority with, and there existed four Hormosts in Rumeria. But Waithus then calls Aussie by his real name, Cassio Dor, who again is another Hormost of Remus, but he was also once the Golden Hunter and founder of the. Come on, man. Mar Maruch. March. March. Hunters, of which Clorinde is a successor of. Aussie reasons the recent happenings with the symphony must be Boethus' doings, and he demands Boethus return the souls of the surface dwellers. I mean, Boethus just like kind of says no, <laughs> and instead adds the return of Phobos is imminent, and that's over the last thousand years, he's merged his soul with the remaining pieces of Phobos, hence why he's got near perfect control of the symphony. Boethus says Fontaine was a mistake. Yep, that just the entire fucking nation. <laughs> <laughs> and Rumeria will rise again. Aussie vows to stop him, but Boethus then invites Aussie to meet with him in the Domus Ori to see if he'll change his mind once he's heard the beautiful symphony. Before we chase after Boethus, Aussie gives us a bit more info on Remus, stating the symphony was created by Remus in an effort to weave destiny anew once the whole, you know, give people new stone bodies didn't exactly do anything to avert the prophecy. But again, the symphony idea failed too. See, the symphony, or Phobos, was meant to guide people and grant them happiness in accordance to their wishes. But as we'll soon see, instead of paradise, the symphony brought apocalypse. 
as we head on in, we come across, you know, a chained whale. I guess it's supposed to be a fucking dragon, but... And Aussie reveals the whale is actually a dragon prince named... Sk All right, see, so I, I googled how to say this word, and it's... I've seen two groups of people say Skyla or Skillia. Months ago, I said Skyla, and I got cooked, so I'm saying Skillia for this video. Skillia, who once worked with Remus. Later, however, he would be defeated and locked up by Boethus. After Paimon expresses shock at how Boethus was able to subdue a dragon... Aussie just, you know, rips this shit to shreds by stating Skillia isn't anything special. He's a bishop who's just a teensy bit stronger than a normal one, which... <laughs> I mean, alright, bro. <laughs> it's kind of fucked up you doing your boy dirty like that. And then, very interestingly, Aussie states the new Hydro Sovereign hadn't been reborn yet as Egeria still lurked in the seas. Aussie then says... While Scylla was once Remus' friend, Scylla betrayed him and led an army to overrun the capital at the worst possible time. So thus, you know, he keeps calling Scylla the evil dragon. Yeah, fuck the bishops, am I right, brother Oss? I'm with you all the way. We then see, despite Boethus inviting Aussie to the Domus, he for some reason locks the entrance, so, I mean, we decide to just set Scylla free and gamble he'll break the seal for us, which he does. Lucky Oss, huh? Uh, before we set him free, however, we get another Remus POV shot. I, you know, I should probably should have could have worded that better. Uh, this, the same servant from earlier tells us the people are gathered in the Great Hall and have questions regarding why the melody of Phobos has been acting up recently. The servant too then wonders what's been going on with Phobos recently, as it was meant to help humanity attain happiness, so there shouldn't be issues, especially not with Sibylia's guidance. Remus then remarks, however, he hears the cries of sorrow from within the melody. The servant wonders how this could be possible, as the only people powerful enough to tamper with the score of Phobos would be either Remus or the other Hormos. It's then revealed Sibylia sacrificed herself to create the Phobos, and the reason it may be acting up is because she had no desires of her own. Given the people of Rumeria rely on Phobos to guide them, if it were to malfunction, then the kingdom would descend into chaos. So then, Remus decides to cut this servant's soul from out the symphony, so as to give him free will as a contingency if something greater happens to the symphony. At the meeting, we come across Boethus, who says many haven't been able to hear the Phobos recently, and as such, they're scared. He says the war is going well. So why then does Remus wish to stop the army's advancements? Remus just sort of says he wants no more bloodshed. I'm noble of him. But Boethus vehemently disagrees with this assessment and begs for more blood. The scene ends there and we are returned to the presence, where the freshly released Scylla reveals he betrayed no one, <laughs> contrary to Aussie's claims, and that's him and the army of bishops attacking the capital was exactly what he promised Remus, as it was a secret plan between the two of them. Scylla, however, points out he failed, and his army couldn't reach the capital before the waves did. Scylla then points out the only one who betrayed anyone was Boethus, who must have learned about the secret deal between Remus and fought to stop Scylla. Aussie then wonders if Boethus was trying to nab control of Phobos even way back then. Scylla then blasts the seal for us, you see our gamble paid off, <laughs> and we head to the Domus. Instead of confronting Boethus like a real man, Scylla instead chooses to peace out because he's a pussy. When we get to the answers of the Domus, we spot Boethus lying in waits. Boethus just kind of reiterates that the surface dwellers must pay and that Remus stopped being fit to rule when he ordered the armies to stop fighting. So Boethus just says, you know, everything he did was, was justified after that. <laughs> he then reveals he did indeed know of the deal between Remus and Scylla, as well as Remus apparently trying to destroy the symphony. Boethus then says, The past matters not, and he shall ascend to become the new god king, to which Ozzy says is impossible, because humans can't become gods. Boethus just kind of, it's literally just, yeah, he just says he's built different. <laughs> So he can do it. He just needs to do the, you know, the small task of grabbing everyone's wills from within the water and merge it with the symphony, including those who are cut out, like Cassio Dor. And then he just needs to, you know, merge them together. He then kidnaps Cassio Dor before inviting the traveler to speak in this fucking soul palace or whatever the hell it was called. He reveals he knows the traveler is not from this planet because he can't see the color of the traveler's soul. You know, they talk about a bunch of, like, ethics and shit. Cassio Dor then saves us from a 
an extremely grueling fight. I mean, they had us a hydro trap, but pew, 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 eating it. We, we would have gotten gangbanged if Cassiodor didn't show up, Lord knows. And Cassiodor then says he knows of a way to defeat Boethus and we should trust him. He then expels us from the Soul Palace and we rebuild the aqueducts to play our own little symphony. We get another Remus vision, however, and in it we see Scylla conversing with Remus, where Scylla says he believes the kingdom and the symphony to be beyond Remus's control. It's revealed Scylla only came to the surface because he wanted to witness Remus create the Endless Paradise free from conflict he promised Egeria he'd make with the goblets, but instead, Remus failed and could not overcome fate. Scylla, by the way, was the one who was guarding stuck in Egeria's prison cell. It's then Remus says to Scylla he has a plan to save everyone. He then tells Scylla the plan and Scylla says he's glad Remus has decided to end Phobos and lets people be free to guide themselves. In the present, the extent of Remus's plans are revealed. Remus wanted to destroy the Phobos, and this was to be done by Scylla, who had been given Remus's last symphony, which was a Phobos self-destruct order. Remus would then end his own life, unleashing the symphony's powers, and it would then be Scylla's job to control the energies released from his death and destroy Phobos, but he needed to reach the capital in time. However, Boethus, who had at this point gone completely rogue, found out the secret dealings between Scylla and Remus, fought Scylla, and sealed him away. So thus, Remus' sacrifice was in vain. He, bro, my guy, Remus, did not have it easy, man. Just killed himself for nothing. At least when Thosalores did it, she, you know, she, she got something out of it. My heart goes off to my dog, Remus, bro. Bro, Celestia just don't miss. They don't miss, dog. You just gotta put down mankind's irrigation. That's what, that, that's all, that's the root of all these problems, man, is mankind's irrigation. Had the plan worked, however, Rumerians would be returned to their flesh and blood once more because it was imperative. Humans put aside their arrogance, you know, because they, would, they, they wouldn't be arrogant anymore because they don't have these fucking immortal bodies. Anyway, we all know where mankind's irrigation gets them. Uh, let's obviously none of this mattered because Boethus likes his stone body way too much. <laughs> uh, so anyway, the traveler in Scylla decides to finish the plan because it would give a sweet release to all the, you know, trapped Rumerians. We play the symphony with Scylla and enter the Domus at last, where it's revealed Boethus wanted his new god form to be the, you know, the stone centaur. Ossie then seemingly merges with Boethus, and we fight the centaur until Boethus seemingly loses control of the body, which he begins to blame Ossie, or I guess I should be calling him Cassiodor, but no, I like Ossie. The body then stabs itself and just like dies. <laughs> we are then dragged into the centaur's mind, where we see Cassiodor and Boethus. However, the thing calling itself Boethus then reveals it was never actually Boethus, but rather Phobos. Phobos says it was once Sibylia, a survivor of the last great deluge that swallowed the earth. Sibylia's only wish was to grant happiness to all humans, but she lacked the strength to make this happen. So she turned to Remus and thus Phobos came to be. Phobos reveals its guidance for Rumerians was simply the sum of all their wishes. So while on the surface, people wished for happiness, what they really desired was war, death, and bloodshed, and so that's what Phobos guided them towards. Once Remus realized that Phobos had been warped by mankind's arrogance and hatred, he realized he needed to destroy Phobos and let people guide themselves. However, once Phobos realized Remus was trying to destroy it, Phobos ate Boethus, who was already unhappy with Remus for stopping the advancements of the army, and Phobos had Boethus do its bidding from there on out, from sealing Scylla thousands of years ago, to trying to engineer its return today. Cassiodor laughs at this turn of events and just tells the Traveler to kill them both to end the symphony. So, we fight the centaur one more time and it just gets clobbered to death by the other golems. And now, with this millennia-long mission done, Cassiodor peacefully passes on, but not before telling the Traveler to play one final requiem for him and Remus. And thus, with the symphony finally destroyed, the Kingdom of Rumeria finally lived its final day. There's one more, like, scene with Scylla, and he's just like, I really need to meet this new Hydro Sovereign, Nervalette, but we'll see. Rumerian lore is... It's very nice. I actually really... I, I liked it a lot more than I thought I would. It, it, there's there's an interesting, um... What is it? Parallel between this and Atlantean, which obviously Atlantis, there's the... the in the Samsara cycle, and there's the, there's the connection, but... I, I needed to do the recap first, then we'll talk about all that fun shit later. Actually, no. Tomorrow, we need to talk about the fucking... The Traveler and Arlecchino, because I just, bro, people, peep, bro, you guys missed the fucking point. <laughs> or I wasn't clear, maybe, I don't know.